Our guest for this session is Colin Lewis, CMO of Open Jaw Technologies. Colin is an award-winning marketeer and has nearly 20 years international experience across the world. He is also the founder and programmer of DMX Dublin, the largest digital marketing event in Ireland, and the program manager for the digital marketing executive program for the Marketing Institute of Ireland. He is also a columnist for the UK's number one magazine for marketing news, opinion and information, Marketing Week. So he's an exceptional marketeer and we're thrilled to have you on the series, Colin. So very much a warm welcome to you and looking forward to chatting to you today about your life today and your, your plans for the future. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, it's going to be an honor. And uh, Very few people ask me about my life, so that's going to be quite interesting to talk to. Okay, well, listen, let's tell me about yourself first, where you're from, you know, your schooling, your early, early part of your life. I'd like to know a bit more about you. Uh, well, I'm an Aquarian. Uh, no, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm from Dublin. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, uh, from the north side of Dublin and went to school in the heart of the city here in the CUS in, in, in the city here. So I went to a rugby school, but um, I was too small and short to actually play rugby. And uh, ended up going to UCD, uh, the Bachelor of Commerce degree, and uh, worked in Ireland for a year or two after that in the late 1980s and then emigrated to uh, Australia. And I lived in Australia and Asia for about eight or nine years. Came back to Ireland just as the boom is getting boomier around 2000. Worked in a couple of um, a very well known technology company called Iona Technology. So I moved from retail into technology and then I joined um, a VC funded startup um, called uh, Marrakesh for a couple of years. Did an MBA in Smartfit and then combined my previous two loves of technology and travel to working for a company called Air Aaron, who are now called Stobart Air, uh, CityJet. And then I was asked to work for a quite a well known company in Ireland called Conduit, but actually very well known across Europe, one of the biggest brands in Europe. And I had a very large marketing campaign, uh, marketing budget, £20 million um, for a couple of years, a company called 118, 118 in the UK or 11850 in Ireland. And then, uh, yeah, I worked for BMI British Midland in the UK as uh, head of marketing with the airline. And for the last couple of years, I've worked for a travel technology company called Open Jaw Technologies. Um, but aside from that, I do a lot of stuff in my spare time. I am a columnist in Marketing Week magazine. Uh, for the last five years, and people actually read my stuff, which is kind of interesting, and uh, have opinions on it. And I speak at a lot of conferences, and I helped set up a conference called DMX Dublin in 2012. And now it's the largest marketing conference in Ireland, and uh, yeah, it's great. And uh, I'm also the author of this particular one, uh, The uh, Best Practices in E-Commerce, uh, 54,000 words, um, I'm expecting you to have read it by tomorrow, Tim. It's, it's absolutely scintillating uh, piece of uh, copywriting and, and, and copy. Uh, so we do a lot of stuff outside of my day job as well. Okay, so in the openness of this uh, chat, I'm definitely not going to read it before oh, tomorrow. You're crushing okay. me. I mean, I spent months writing that, uh, Tim, and it's like an exceptionally high demand. I cannot believe you discriminate against me like that. Yeah, completely. So let me just go back to the north side. Obviously, there was one famous uh, north side person who ended up playing rugby for Ireland. And, uh, but did you play any other sport in school or what other sports interested uh, you? No, I was, um, uh, no, not really, because um, I, I, I'm, I'm reasonably, I'm not that tall, I'm reasonably short. And uh, I was very slim figure. And uh, what happened was I was diagnosed in my mid-20s that I'm actually a celiac. So I was one of these people who could never put on weight. So I was always very small. And uh, so on the rugby pitch, I would get pummeled into the ground because I'd be the hooker or, uh, or the out half. And I'd be like, bang. So I was like, no way, I can't do that. <laughs> so no, what I am is a huge, um, my dad was a mechanic, okay? And okay. So I've been surrounded by cars my whole life. And that's what all these car books are doing here. So I'm a complete and utter petrol head. And I, so, I, I race so cars, me- I look at cars, I think about cars, I just... I got, yeah, I'm in a case when it comes to that. Okay, so let's go to the big Formula One, one question that I would have. Hamilton or Schumacher, who's the greatest? Uh, I, I actually don't know. My, my favorite guy is a guy called Emerson Fittipaldi because when I was a kid, yes. he was a very famous guy. And growing up in Ireland in the 19, whatever it was, 70s and 80s, there was nobody with such an exotic name. Most people would call Pat and Mick. Uh, but here was somebody called Emerson. And I 
was like, so that was the name that stuck in my mind. And he raced this beautiful black and gold car. So he, to me, he was always the best. Okay. So listen, moving on. So you, you're now with um, Open Jaw, right? And you made a point. You've had a very extensive career you know, with a lot of different firms and different yeah. organizations. As you move through those organizations, what was the thing that separated you, you know, from others, did you feel, you know, on a personal point of view? Um, well, you know, this is something I kind of, I get asked a lot about career advice. I mean, Morgan uh, knows this. And um, it's one of the things I've noticed over the, over the years. I mean, talking even when I was 25, people would even ask me for career advice and stuff like that. And I think the one thing I think that is unique is to be able to, see the world from another person's perspective. Now, I actually think it's not unique to me to a certain extent. Um, I think uh, as Irish people, we come from the factory with this, um, with, uh, with this notion of inquisitiveness and interest in other people. And then that becomes a, like a superpower if you emigrate and live abroad. So I've lived abroad for you know, maybe a third of my life and uh, my working career. And you realize very quickly that there's a couple of things that Irish people have that are almost unique, which is, first of all, we're interested in other people. Uh, nosy okay, is another word for that. Um, we're also reasonably uh, articulate and we can communicate our perspective um, pretty well. And we also know how to engage with other cultures. We, we're, we're coming from a, a smaller culture to a larger culture always. And those are the things to me that kind of really kind of made me kind of stand out um, over others. Um, was 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 just the ability to engage with people, and 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 then after the fact, as you get older, you start going, I I would recognize my unique abilities and just start doubling down on them rather than kind of focus on the weak stuff, if you will. So then, you, when you joined Open Jaws, so you know what was the ambition for you and for the company at that point, and uh, well, how long you with them? Well, that was a good point because uh, it's a good question, I should say, uh, because I had to be convinced. Convinced is not with the word, but I, I kind of. I had been working in the UK and commuting for the previous six years. Okay. And I actually wanted to tie out a time off. I, mean, I wanted to sit and read. As you can see from my library here beside me, I like just reading. Uh, so, so just as a sidebar, somebody asked, a lot of people asked me, should they do an MBA? And I like, well, you know, maybe, you know. And, and I, I remortgaged my house to do the MBA. Uh, so it's 30 grand. Really? Yeah. And... Um, um, and I, 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 people asked me what I'd get from the MBA, and I said, I rediscovered my love of reading, and that was worth the 30 grand. Well, that's fascinating, um, Colin, because I did an executive MBA in, in NUIG, and what I found it, it did for me was that it, it validated some of my thoughts yes. and some of my principles. You know, it made me realize that I wasn't you know, foolish in certain things I was doing. And it gave me a great learning and understanding of things that I was missing. So, you know, when you put it all together, I came out of my executive MBA from NUIG, a better, more accomplished professional. Yeah, that's and, great. You know, yeah, yeah. And, you, were, you were, it's like, it wasn't this like moment of like, ta-da, and now, uh, you know, with one, with one leap, our hero, you know, escapes free. No, no, it, it was just a more, if you will, uh, enhanced, if that's the word, version of, of who you are. Um, but you're better at the things you were good at and more sort of um, comfortable with the things you were not so good at, but knew what you missed. And I think the other thing for me that it did is that it, it taught me that even in an MBA environment, because you're obviously put into groups and do different uh, workshops and, and different things together, it makes you realize that you, you can't do it all. You need other people to help you get through your MBA, which I really found you know, sort of reinforced by philosophy. We're, we're part of a unit. And, you know, we all have roles in the unit, but that's also what it identified for me, that everybody has a part to play, Colin. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting, Tim, because the, the, the project groups, you know, uh, the whole thing within an MBA, are, um, they're anathema to what it's like in school. And I, this is one of the things I try to communicate with people a lot more, because I do a lot of teaching. I do like about 100 hours of teaching a year. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a notion within... Um, School, which is no copying, or when I was in school, we'd call it cogging. Yeah, no cogging. Yeah, yeah. No, no looking at what other people worked. And, and, and of course, that's exactly the opposite to the real world where it has to be working together and, and, and copying, you know. And, and, and I use, uh, I'm not even sure that we have it at hand, but 
I always say to people, what you need to do is steal like an artist, as Austin Cleo writes, which is you, you, the only way you can innovate is by assimilating other people's work, you know? And, and so therefore you have to, uh, what's the word? Imitate, uh, assimilate, innovate, as Clark Terry would say. Well, what I would say, Colin, is that if you take one person's idea, it's called plag- plagiarism. If you take 10 people's ideas, it's called research. So research was a big factor. <laughs> I love it. I love research it. was a big factor for me d- during my educational program. Yeah, today, yeah. Today. So, so let, let's roll forward. I mean, I fascinated first of all, before you roll forward, about two things. You said that you teach for 100 hours. Where do you do your teaching? I, do, I teach for the Marketing Institute of Ireland. Uh, I teach, uh, I've done stuff for TUD and IE Instituto Impressa in uh, Madrid as well. And so it's like a three different kind of setups. And um, I also do for e-consultancy out of London, I do internal training for organizations as well. And it's kind of part, part of my deal. It's like uh, anybody who I work with to say, if you are me, I'm also going to be teaching in the evenings or maybe four days a year, I'll do in-house work groups because um, the, the, you know, we talked about the MBA as a sort of a, a pivotal moment, if you will. The other thing that's been super pivotal for me um, is, um, it sounds very American, but like a pivotal moment is this notion of the moment you can teach something is when you get better at, at what you do. I, I don't know how much, uh, you know, I know you do a lot of talking, but in terms of teaching, uh, literally, you know, if you can imagine a, a career like that, my career going trundling along, ups and downs, you know, ins and outs, whatever, and then the exponential curve occurs in 2011 in terms of my own capabilities because I had to start teaching. And uh, so I love the teaching more than almost anything else. You know, the thing you would do for free, well, that's what I would do for free. And pretty much it is for free in most cases. You know, it's, it's, it's very much low value anyway. But your capabilities as a person in terms of knowledge, technical, and the ability to persuade, the ability to communicate, uh, just grow up. Um, just it's like go up exponentially, and uh, that's why I I, I I love the teaching uh, more than almost more than anything else. And just to develop that point, I do some teaching as well, and and have done for many years. You're absolutely right; it does test you because yeah. you can have your own knowledge, and and it can be very strong in certain areas. But to have the ability to influence and and see other people develop their own journey through your teaching is always for me very rewarding because it does test all the skills you've identified but it also gives you at the end of it it gives you just a sort of a feeling of i've made a little difference in that person's journey and that's you know that's if we can all do that every day you know the world kind of nice place for all of us in that sense you know well, i've seen um i've seen firsthand with my sister my sister uh, taught in school for 30 years and um i, I knew she was a good teacher but I didn't realize how good a teacher she was until I was walking down the street with her, I think it was like a good few years ago, maybe 15 years ago, um, I was looking at a particular area to go buy a house. And this woman ran out from the house to go and t- say, you know, Miss Lewis, Miss Lewis, oh, you're such a great teacher. And I was like, what, what was that about? You know, she said, oh, she used to be in my class, blah, blah, blah. So the girl had recognized her, run out from the house and said, what a great teacher she was. And so we, we don't realize we're teaching um, I, you know, the, the, the effect you can have. And that's why I kind of like always try to be on my best game possible. Um, there, uh, you touched on a great word there. What was the word? Uh, influence and, 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 and uh, touching on that. Um, it, the other thing about, you know, we've talked about teaching, we've talked about, um, uh, about the MBA and so on. But for people uh, watching this is, I'd like them to kind of break out in their mind that there's, there's, you ha- one has to develop the skill of influence and the skill of persuasion. And, and the problem is they're a bit sort of uh, uh, seen as sort of dark hearts. Uh, and, uh, but the moment you're born is the moment you start persuading and, and start influencing. You're trying to you know, convince your mother to buy the sweets in the shop kind of thing. You're trying to do it. We're always, always persuading and always trying to influence. And one of the things I do try and get across to people is to tune into this notion that what will make a career for you is that you can understand what persuasion is and what influence is and strip out this notion of it being some sort of dark arts that's actually something that you have to do to become really good in your career. And what's fascinating about that point is that we're born with that. I mean, you're, you're, like from, from our childhood, we are 
you know, persuading our parents and our, our siblings to do things for us and our aunts and uncles and grandparents. And as we go through our life, you know, persuasion and influence, I, I have always felt is very important, especially if you're trying to get points across to people, because if you don't influence them, you can't change the, you know, their, their, their reaction to you because you can't control their reaction. All you can do is influence their reaction. And if you're making your point on stage or in, in a teaching environment, is to persuade your point of view, because it is just your point of view, Colin. That's all you know. people are getting at that point in time. It's, it's, um, w w one of the critiques I have of uh, a lot of people, and again, you, as, it's back to the teaching, which is you learn so much in the class, I and mean, the teacher learns as much as the, as the student is the, is the cliche. Well, it's, it's what I found is absolutely true. And uh, I have a, a bit, there's one particular series I've been doing three times a year for the last 10 years, and on lecture one of the three part series, I give it about five or 10 minutes. Okay. And, um, sure enough, within five or 10 minutes, somebody puts their hand up and says, well, I believe Colin, you know, or well, I think Colin. Okay. And I have this kind of little kind of dog pony routine. I was like, well, like <laughs> your, your, your opinion is totally irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't care what you think. Now the context, you know, I'm not being an asshole in the class, but the context yeah. is, I don't, I don't want you to bring your preconceived beliefs to the table. And I, I, I now, with you know what's happened over the last number of years in terms of how we're seeing the world through these filter bubbles and through these lenses that are actually uh, curated by other people or cur curated by algorithms, um, one of the things I, I say to people is now, uh, maybe you don't even, you can't even believe yourself and you definitely cannot believe what's on the screen or the paper in front of you because somebody else is mediating that for you. Okay. So you have to observe, um, your opinion much better and much more closer, um, than you would have even had to 10 years ago because it's actually just an amalgam of things that you thought and read, not actually your true opinion. Uh, and so it's a real kind of thing I want to get across to people is your opinion is not your opinion. You just think it is. Okay, so if I just tease that out a bit further on that point, I believe that if you come into a, a concept or a program or an environment with an open mind, you can formulate your opinion from the open mind coming in. If Absolutely. you come in with a preconceived idea, then it's not. It is your, your opinion has been formed, has been framed by other lenses. So yeah. my, my guidance to my clients would be: open your mind, open your mind, and we, and we it's unknown what we can do when we when we open our mind to see. You know, well, other it, things and other people's it, inputs. It, it, what I find is it, that there's th something that I just did there. First of all, is that our minds, even though you know um, to be have a growth mindset, to be open, is that sometimes we're as we discuss amongst each other, we're planning our next phrase before the other person has kind of finished. You know, so we're clearly not listening correctly, and I, you know, I sort of pseudo interrupted you there because I was like so excited about getting my point across here. Yeah? And, uh, and this is, you know, harmless enough in this environment because we're having, you know, a bit of, bit of chat and we both know where we're at. But in many cases, many of us are not listening to the other person truly. Uh, we're, we're waiting to get our opinion across sooner rather than later. And it's just the thing I try and say to people as much as possible. And I'm also looking in the mirror when I say this as well is, just observe yourself and your uh, opinions uh, a lot closer. Uh, I have a little story that's kind of self-deprecating in this context here, Tim. So you might have a laugh at this, but you okay. Uh, I have I'm a car fanatic, okay? As yes. you know, and, um, and I and I use this story to unpack it in people's minds. Okay, so I go and say, you know, um, you know, to sh show you how ridiculous the idea of opinions are. Let me give you a story of a ridiculous opinion. Let, let me give you mine. Yeah, let, let me show you a ridiculous person. Okay. And that person is me. And I, the story goes something like this. I say, um, uh, I say, you know, so, so Tim, what sort of car have you got? You know, and you might say like a Toyota or whatever it is. Do, do you have a car? Do you have a car? An XC60 Volvo. An XC60 Volvo. Exactly. And I go and say, well, I, I've got, I've got an NG. How come you don't have an NG? And the, the person's looking at me going, what is this guy smoking? You know? And I say, but actually, I don't, I have four cars, all in various states of disrepair. And they're four, you know, one doesn't work, one's in a garage, one's got a wheel off, but I've got four NGs. How come you don't, Tim? 
because I've got four, you must therefore have four MGs as well. And people are looking at me going, you're completely nuts, Colin. And I say, yes, that's what we are doing when we observe people and with our opinion and say, how come you don't have four MGs? Because I've got four MGs. It's as ridiculous as that, okay? And it's ridiculous as you say to me, Colin, I've got a Volvo. How come you don't have a Volvo? And me looking at you going, why would I want a Volvo? You know, this is the disconnect we have with opinions. I think what's interesting about the point you made about listening, I talk to uh, people of communication all the time, and I make the point that when we're not talking, it doesn't mean we're listening, and your point is so valid. We're just waiting for the other person to be quiet, and then we'll give him our view or we'll, we'll ask our question. And the danger for that, and even in these conversations, the danger is we miss some nugget. You know, we missed something that, that was said because we haven't really picked it up from that point of view. So the thing about your MGs, your four MGs, uh, I wish you well with them, but I don't want an MG. I have to buy <laughs> I need a lot of wishes and, and money. Send money, please, for repairs. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's roll forward. We've talked, you know, about, you know, your, your, some of your hobbies, some of your interests, and obviously your career to date. But let's go to the start of this year. And, you know, you're, you're looking into 2020. What were your... Obje ambitions for yourself and, and for your organization, both personally and professionally, for 2020? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I, um, I kind of set a plan out at the start of the year. Uh, plans, plans sounds, uh, sounds like I'm some sort of planner. Now. A sketch out of what I kind of wanted to do this year. And I had a kind of series of motor races I wanted to do personally. And I wanted to kind of uh, reconstruct some of the stuff I've written here into a book. and. Um, I was going to be spending more time in London because my other half works in London a lot more. And, you know, it was all kind of a reasonable plan. But um, I had a funny experience in January, which was, excuse me, open jar owned by a Chinese company. And I'd already been to China the previous November. And I knew the whole thing because the company has an office in Dalian in northeast China and 150 staff there. So we knew about the Wuhan uh, thing going on in Wuhan and coronavirus weeks before anybody else and had a real effect on the business. So we had a sort of premonition of what was going to happen. Um, now that sounds like uh, I was Madame Zelda looking to a crystal ball. Even for a good few weeks, we were still going, well, it won't be this, it won't be that, it won't be the other. And um, I, what was the second week of March when we had lockdown here? Um, that was it. That was where everything completely turned upside down. And But my sense of foreboding was about two and a half, three weeks earlier. So if you take that point, so you had prior knowledge of something happening at that point, and we didn't know what was happening, but something was happening. How did you deal with it initially? I mean, did you, did you just ignore and say, well, look, this might become a big thing or it might be not? Or did you say, no, we've got to make some adjustments? Or did you just carry well, on? I mean, no, we already started at rethinking the budget, re rethinking the plans for sure. Uh, by February, we knew we weren't going to be doing any trips to Asia for at least six months. The very little corporate travel. Uh, we had a sense that the airlines themselves would be in big trouble. We had a sense, obviously, it was very easy to know because in China they stopped flying, so we knew that could happen in Europe as well. Um, what was a very interesting thing at that time, Tim, was that um, I had interesting in insider knowledge. Yes. Uh, and that's sort of like, as they say, I'm a man of the world. I'm not like some Pollyanna-ish person walking around, and I'm reasonably well-read. And so I'm not a fool, and, but even I was going, well, yeah, probably by summer or fine, you know, to be okay, everything's fine. And, you know, a, a little bit of denial, if you will. And, but I was an insider. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm an insider yeah. with good knowledge and a deep and wide expertise in an industry and see the numbers coming on my screen. And I know, particularly because I worked for airlines for about 10 years, so I know what could happen. And I know, I mean, I can tell you what happens on Monday morning, nine o'clock in every airline in the world. Yeah. And I knew what, what actually happened. Sorry, <laughs> what happened? Sorry, what oh, happened? You, you look at uh, what, uh, what came in over the weekend. Uh, and so you look at, um, uh, you know, uh, first of all, numbers that came in over the weekend, how that's panning out for the week. Um, and then what was your, uh, what do you call it, punctuality? operation capabilities, all that sort of stuff that happens pretty much between 9 and 11 every every Monday. And that keeps going during the week because all airlines have a very similar rhythm, if you will. Yeah, uh, Business flights Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, commuter flights Thursday night, Monday morning, 
um, via for visiting family and friends, um, later flights, and also then leisure flights, Saturdays or um, uh, Thursdays. So you know the rhythm. Yeah. Okay, so I was just developed the point you said earlier, though. You made a point that you were an insider yeah. and you, you, you had prior knowledge because obviously of yeah. your, your base in China. And yet you were in denial. That's just an interesting word to say that you were in denial. Can you just tease that out a bit for me? Yeah. Um, I, and like, I, I, what was interesting, I was even observing myself at the time. I was like, why am I in denial about this thing, even though I know it's going to happen? Why? Um, and so I was kind of like running this real time thing in my head at the time going, oh, so we can really deny ourselves reality, even when you have, um, it, there's a phrase, you know, the phrase information asymmetry. Well, the majority of the world's population would have been in, if our business world would have been having information asymmetry, but I didn't have the asymmetry because I had the insider knowledge. I had a coffee with the VP China and he told me that sales were down 95% in one of the biggest airlines that we had um, in the first week of February. Yeah. And he told me, and I was like, oh, wow, things are bad. Ooh. But I couldn't transfer that to British Airways or to Iberia or to Air France. Okay. I couldn't make the leap. And I'm an expert. And tell me, what was that just something that you didn't want to make the leap? Or is it just... I just couldn't imagine. Just say, I just could you know, not imagine it. Yeah. Like us all, I couldn't imagine that this would happen. I was... Where, it, it, where human nature is to be in slightly in denial about what could happen in the future. We, we, we just don't. We're, we're kind of catching glimpses of the future rather than having perfect knowledge. And is that a reflection of the fact that you know, we've all had ups and downs in our careers and, you know, like no more differently than you, Colin. But is it that we look for the glass to be half full and therefore we say, look, this pandemic, you know, COVID-19 can't do this to us? Or is it just we, we, we put blinkers on and hope it doesn't no do frame. it? We had no frame of reference. Uh, okay. I think, you know, let, let, let me take a, a slight sidebar and then maybe try to bring it back, bring it back to make it kind of uh, a little more sort of uh, 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 real for people. So as Irish people, um, we are not, we are familiar with recessions. We're familiar with mass immigration. We're familiar with a lot of ups and downs in, in, in things. Okay. Where I say, if we lived in Australia, there has been no recession in Australia till this year. And so their outlook on the world is the world's not just, the cup's not just half empty. It's overflowing. Yeah. Yes. They have a totally different perspective. Yeah. And, but we're in Ireland, we're a little bit more up and down. Okay. And so we're actually not, the worst being happening to us is not actually the worst because we've been through a lot of bad stuff. Okay, great. But even still with all that and our reasonably robust character you know, to cope with these sort of things, um, the fact we still got taken surprise, surprise, and even me with um, insider knowledge kind of proves to the point that our model of the world is always about looking backwards and transferring what happened in the past to the future as though it's going to continue, even with people who in theory have a little better knowledge than most. And so therefore, another thing I would be saying to people looking at this is to, you know, your preconceptions, your opinions, uh, all these sort of things, just observe as much as possible how you are bringing the past into the future. And by the way, I'm one of the worst offenders, okay? I am a terrible offender in this. Just observe yourself and go, why am I bringing the past into the future? Uh, Irish people do it badly. Australians don't. Americans used not to. Um, so just observe that. And uh, as I say, the COVID-19 was a perfect example of that, how we, even with inside knowledge, could not bring uh, believe that the past was uh, not the same as the future. Yeah, and to wrap up this point, we changed all the budgets. We reforecast re everything. Uh, we put, you know, chop the marketing budget down by 50%. We did everything. And we knew, we thought we were fairly robust. And then we realized in April that wasn't the case. And what type of strain did that put on you and put on the company? I mean, if you look at it, you know, he, he reforecast things. You, he, he made some pivots early on. You know, with, with that knowledge that you had, and yet in April you found yourself in a really difficult situation. It, I think it's exactly the same situation as that all companies would have been, which was that your previous forecast, your previous way of thinking um, went out the window. And you, you realized very quickly that the companies, you're also your customers didn't necessarily know that much better either. And um, what you were doing is thinking about the world in a much shorter period of time because it was very clear 
um, that you couldn't go and say, well, here's the exact what's going to happen in October. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I was uh, working for an airline in the UK, BMI, and I remember I was in the board meetings um, with the investor, a very wealthy individual, and he keep torturing us over forecasts. We were doing forecasts of the forecasts of the forecasts. And I got to be a little bit sort of more, uh, what's the word, uh, circumspect, circumspect with respect to forecasts, because what I realized that a lot of it is uh, guesswork mixed with some data rather than data that is brutally pragmatic about how the future will pan out, because you just don't know. And that was the zone that most businesses were in, in March, April, where it was, how's the future going to pan out? This is our best guess. How many people are working in Open John? Uh, it's just over 400. Okay, so you 400 people in, in, now in March, April, in this real uncertain world, in an yeah. industry that is obviously even more affected than others in, in the position. How did you lead those people through that journey? Um, well, one of the things I, I work closely with the chief exec um, on this is, and it's still a work in progress, uh, like, like with many people, is um, to how should one communicate with a team when uh, everybody's remote? And how do you give them a frame of reference uh, about the future? And one of the things I did myself personally was study how um, some of the businesses in China and in Asia had pulled together communication programs to communicate with people. And one of the ones I did a lot of was look at what had happened at the end of quarter one. And many big companies, and the example I used uh, a lot to look at was Nike. So Nike specifically have to go on to an analyst meeting at the end of the first quarter and tell them what they did. And they talked about what they were focusing on in China and how they could think about the future. And they had this kind of um, three or four um, uh, a model, like a three-stage model. And what I did was kind of um, build out that model um, uh, using slightly different words and use that with as a communication tool for everything that we would do for the following three or four months, which was, you know, we're going through a period of retrenchment. We're going to then be, you know... Uh, I've forgotten even my model, by the way, but we, we, we created this four or model of how um, we were going to communicate to the team and also to, uh, to the customers. And what that did was give a frame that everybody could kind of say, well, we're, anchor we're anchored in this spot and now we're going to go to the next spot and then we're going to go to the next frame. And it was kind of around, you know, the first few weeks was the bad period. Um, there's a bit of like, you know, rejuvenation happening between now and Christmas, if you will, because we now can see how things are going to pan out here. Yeah? Um, so uh, that, that was one of the things we really focused on was how do you communicate internally and externally as to what you're doing? And you have to be super explicit and be as, uh, uh, as frank as possible because you don't have all the data. And the, the important thing there is about being as frank as possible to your people because they have their own worries. They have health worries. They have family worries. They have economic worries. They have all the worries that, that we all have individually. And what we look for in that is our, our leaders to be very clear and, and dis decisive and, and concise with us. And, you know, being frank is a nice word, Colin, that you've just used. How often did you communicate with them? Was it weekly, daily, monthly? Well, initially, uh, it, 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 it was informal starting out and then it became a lot more formal um, over a period of time simply because we had to kind of go and say, here's what's happened, here's what's going on, and here's... Because, you know, one of the things that many businesses don't have, they don't have what they call the water cooler bit where information passes around um, just by people yes. chatting amongst each other. And so one of the things I would say to people, um, you know, working, um, who, are, who are leaders working through this kind of period is that information has to be communicated explicitly. Um, whereas you could rely on implicit communication before. And the explicit communication has to be um, super specific as much as possible um, because um, people aren't engaging with material uh, like they would have before and their frame of reference how they would have been engaging with that is, 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 is much different. Um, I, I, you know, just as an aside, I mean, I, I think, Tim, when we're recording this right now, um, there's a lot of confusion as to what's going on in Ireland in terms of the communication of what's going on as well. And it's being slightly, uh, what's the word, uh, harnessed by social media. And, you know, that's an example of unclear communication, uh, both in the UK and in Ireland, that is causing confusion. 
but I, I'm not even going to criticize them because I'm sure they have both A, the best intentions, and B, they don't mean to miscommunicate. It just shows how hard it is. It's very difficult to communicate. And I think oh, it's very important for people going through this COVID challenge for organizations and for individuals is that we communicate clearly, we communicate um, explicitly, and we communicate often. And we cannot spend enough time communicating, you know, because one of the challenges that I see, Colin, for people like yourself and other leaders is your job is to make sure there's a business to come back to and the people that you have in your business come back to you. And that's not an easy task in the challenging world like COVID continues to throw us every day. Well, I would say it's actually in this case now the small things I can. You could possibly, you know, uh, Tim could have gone on stage and done a big dog and pony show on stage and relied on his body language or, or, or his, you know, his uh, Obama-style rhetoric flourishes to be able to communicate. But it's not possible like that through screen and, and through email. So I, I'm now literally, literally um, Mr. Micro, micromanagement on emails, you know, whereby it's like, <coughs> excuse me, the layout of the email is explicitly <coughs> laid out. The bullets are clearly laid out. And somebody looks at the email two or three times to see that we, uh, we haven't got the, you know, the tone wrong or the spelling wrong, which could, and so on. So it's like every detail counts when people are locked away. Every detail always counts, actually. It's yeah. interesting, Colin. Mm -hmm. We just have sort of have a different lens in it now. Sure. Are, are there any other, strategic, any other strategic things that you did or that you're doing uh, right now in the company? Uh, well, it, 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 the company had come off the back of 43% um, growth over the, over the previous three years and had really gained a lot of traction. Um, one of the things that's happening right now is that the, we're seeing what's happening in China right now. And uh, so that's been kind of very interesting that China is now sort of the harbinger of the future. <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, uh, China has, um, it's about 80% of what it was before, which is not bad. Um, it's got a big domestic market. Um, so, but they've learned to live with COVID. And this is one of the interesting points that uh, we've kind of baked into our thinking and plans, uh, but we haven't necessarily in Ireland, is that uh, we that there is a way of coping with COVID. Um, it's just that some countries have not made that decision. So open jaw to a certain extent is getting the benefit of the fact that China is coming at the far side, but then not getting the benefit when some of the European countries are, 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 are not uh, building up that capability. The, the series is called The Mindset Shift. And, you know, can you just give me some ideas in your career where, where you've seen your mindset shift, you know, from a sort of um, into a more growth mindset or, how often has that happened to you or does that happen to you regularly or naturally? Yeah, uh, well, one thing I want to disavow anybody who's reading this that um, either me or anybody else that Tim is interviewing is he's been on some glorious upward career schedule that just goes like that and everything's rosy in the garden. Uh, anybody who tells you that or even hints at that in their LinkedIn profile is, is basically a spoofer. Um, Careers move in sideways, okay? They go up and they go down. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. It's not a permanent upward shift, first of all. Secondly, um, um, and this speaks to people who are in their mid to late 20s and early 30s. Um, up to the age of about 30, you kind of get away with, I wouldn't say murder, but you, you're seen as young, you're not too far out of university, you can do quite well. Once you hit 31, 32, you're on your own. You're, you better have your you know, you're <clears throat> together uh, to as you as you focus in the future. And sure enough, that's what happened to me around my early 30s. Things had gone very well. And then it was like, well, is that it? What's what's next kind of thing? And that coincided actually with me moving back to Ireland. And because I went and said, you know, I've done a lot of the things I wanted to do. Uh, and that's great. Now I want to do something different. So there's also... Um, what do you call pivot moments in careers? And I think they occur between sort of roughly between 30, obviously starting out, and then roughly 30 to 35. And then when you'll hit 40, um, or, and if you're a woman and you have kids, or even a, father, a, a, a man, you have kids, but particularly um, uh, for a woman, um, that also is a pivotal moment. And then there's once you hit your early to mid 40s of, okay, what's next? Because you've probably done a lot of things you wanted to do. And then you're like, is this it? Um, uh, and you, 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 the, 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 you maybe not, don't want to go up the greasy career pole. You might want to be doing something different with your life. So 
this is the point I go and say, all of those things happened to me. I thought it was a cliche, but it turns out all these things do actually happen. You hit these pivotal moments and you've got to try and, you know, muddle through and make the best decisions possible. And yeah, all those happened to me. And, you know, there'd be moments of like where, particularly around, I think, 04, 05, and I've written a lot about this, is where um, it was just like, there was very few career options. There was very few career opportunities for me. Everybody else appeared to be doing fine. My career was a disaster. What the hell was going on? And it wasn't that the world was bad or I was bad. It was just more um, sometimes, A, you need a lucky break, and you make your lucky breaks by being out in the field, if you will, but also what I call recognizing opportunity. And I didn't recognize opportunity. I didn't have the frame of reference to recognize opportunity or even how to create opportunity. And, and, and that's the problem if you... Um, you can fall into this trap of not knowing how to create opportunity. But as a credit, you you did you, know, you, you did take those setbacks in the chin, and you did reinvent yourself, and you did you know move forward despite the fact you had to deal with the the impact of all those challenges that you talk about uh, in two thousand four, five, and, and and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I wrote. It was kind of a funny experience I had in in March, April this year. Um, I, um, so I write for Marketing Week magazine and normally I'm writing about marketing topics, marketing effectiveness and what's it like to be a leader in a marketing. It's all kind of fun and dandy. But then, um, in COVID, um, immediately I was like, oh, a load of people are going to lose their job. A load of people are going to be stuck at home. And, uh, and I said, maybe I'll just write something about what happened to me career wise. And, um, so I wrote it and it was out released in April and, uh, I got literally people from all over the world writing to me and I wrote a follow up in, in May and a follow up in June. And, uh, I've had people from Fiji, uh, Chile, uh, Australia, New York, Germany, uh, Italy, everywhere, all over the world writing to me going, this was the most amazing thing I've read. You speaking exactly to my experience. Thank you very much for all of this and so on. And then you start realizing that your experiences, um, are a not unique, obviously. And B, um, you know, when you see people both your age and then like 30 years younger saying, I've had exactly the same kind of like things happen to me or experiences or, or you've given me a, you know, a rocket to go and help me make, make the world different for them. Um, it was really, um, it was kind of like this moment of like, oh, oh, all that crappy stuff that happened. Um, the fact that I kind of turn it into something for other people was probably the most gratifying piece. Like if we're talking then hundreds, if not thousands of people have then kind of, if you will, benefited from that. And I'm kind of now working on a, on a program to try and improve that for a lot of people. I've actually taken the content and turned it into a, a 20,000 page, a 3,000 word, um, little book for people to kind of go and follow. Because what I found was people, people read a lot about leadership and they read a lot about careers and a lot of it's not applicable. You know, a lot of it's not based on um, hard fact, and a lot of it's based on people who've worked in pretty big companies where they're kind of cobbled from the rest of the world. And, you know, I'm not saying my experience is better, not by a long shot, but to give somebody career advice or, or leadership advice or whatever, you kind of have to have a little bit of the school of hard knocks in there, partly because a lot of the stuff that we hear is from the one percent and not from the ninety nine percent I think the point about the the one percent is so so valuable for people because the world is a small place ultimately another seven point four or five billion people, but we all go through ninety nine percent go through similar challenges you know your experience is is, is different but not unique it's and there's you know people as you said from all over the globe have been contacted you in regard to this. If you were to say, you know, to the, I suppose, the viewers of this, one final tip, what would that be, Colin? And would you consider, you know, the journey you've been on to date, when you consider the successes you've had, Colin, the challenges you've had, the challenges you continue to have, and the future as, as we see it as it is today? What's the one thing you would say to people, you know, as we bring this to a close? Uh, well, I say three things. You know, I, I go and say embrace a growth mindset. Um, work out how to create opportunity and develop deep skill base. That's how, how you can be, uh, build a great future for yourself. They're the three things. Work out, have a growth mindset, um, 
create, embrace opportunity, recognize opportunity, and develop skills. Uh, I want to just touch on that skills piece because yep. the world speaks to you that you should be a generalist. And I say, no, people hire skills. Yeah, they hire for skills and they hire for hard skills. And there's a lot of talk out there about, you know, leadership to be this and you need to be good at no. not. Uh, I can tell you, particularly between the age of 20 and 35, they are hiring you for skills, not for your personality or for your leadership capabilities. Um, they are hiring for skills. So skills are now even more important. So specialist rather than generalist, look for yeah. the opportunities and have a, have yeah. a growth and mindset. Have a growth mindset, exactly. They're the three I teach and hopefully I try to live up. Colin, it's been a real uh, pleasure for me to chat to you today on the Mindset Shift. I really thank you for taking the time to join us and we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot for your time, Tim, and thanks a lot to really the Talent Hub for this opportunity. Thank you for watching the Mindset Shift. For more episodes, check out www.talenthub.ie forward slash the mindset shift.